the original sin in the Nicola Bully case was sensitivity, withholding information, editorializing what went out, what was withheld from the public, and that was compounded by ego and by sensationalism from the media. And it was basically the perfect storm of bad motivations, motivations to look sensitive and virtue signal, motivations to guard one's reputation and business opportunities, and motivation from the media to create drama and viral moments. And I can see why this case blew up, because it was a perfect storm of bad motivations. And very last, the very bottom of the list was actually finding out what actually happened to Nicola. And I'm not sure if we're going to figure that out from the police statements. We might figure it out from listening to what Paul Ansel says in his interviews and seeing what we can glean about Nicola as, as a person and what we can glean from him as a person and his relationship with her. But as far as figuring it out from the media or the police, That's going to be very, very difficult, but we're going to try. When are lies justified? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to continue watching a compilation of interviews with Peter Falding, the head investigator Um, or actually a third-party investigator on the Nicola Bully case. The YouTuber Just Gone Viral made this compilation, so please do consider giving Just Gone Viral a follow. And I'm linking the original video in the description below. This is the second in our Nicola Bully series, so if you want to see part one, you can find that on my playlists. Without further ado, let's listen. I've got some very important uh, breaking news uh, to bring you. This uh, literally just in from uh, Lancashire Police, who have told us that uh, a body has been found in the River Wire. Let me read you the statement uh, in its entirety. Uh, This morning, Sunday the 19th of February, you may be aware of police activity around the river near to St Michael's on Wire. Uh, We want to provide you with an update on that activity. Intamam Rashid was telling us, obviously, about that search a short time ago. Police say we were called at 11.36 this morning to reports of a body in the River Wire close to Rawcliffe Road. An underwater search team and Specialist officers have subsequently attended the scene, entered the water and have sadly recovered a body. Now, please go on to say that no formal identification has been carried out yet. So they are unable to say whether this is Nicola Bully at this time. If you didn't see part one, basically this compilation is clips following the story of Peter Falding's involvement with the Nicola Bully case in chronological order, or rather semi-chronological order. So we started um, at the beginning before he was involved in the case. Then while he was doing his searches of the river wire where Nicola supposedly disappeared. And now we're at the stage um, in this compilation where Nicola uh, Nicola Bully's body has been recovered. And if you've seen my comments on my previous video, lots of the comments say there's more to this case than just an accident or a suicide. So even though I'm going into this, basically assuming that it's an accident or a suicide because those are the most common uh, reasons, right? Statistically, that's the most likely scenario. Um, And based on the little bit of information I've read online, those seem to be the most likely scenarios, particularly an accident. I am open to the idea that there is some other explanation. For example, um, a a murder by a stranger or a murder by her boyfriend, Paul Ansel, although those rank very low on my um, probability list. However, we will analyze statements of Paul Ansel. Lots of you have sent me uh, videos to analyze early interviews he did where you're, where you tell me that he says some bizarre stuff. And if I sense that, if I pick it up when we analyze his statements, then we'll stack up some more poker chips that he had some sort of involvement. 
But right now we're just getting the lay of the land. So um, for all of you telling me I need to do a lot more research into this or I need a lot more background, that's what we're doing here, right? We're starting at the beginning. I think this is a good place to start. Um, I want to see what the head investigator has to say, specifically what he has to say about the Lancashire police who are on the case, because I think that a common theme with all the unsolved mysteries we've seen on the channel are bungled investigations by police. So in this case, we have a unique insight into the police through the eyes of Peter Falding, who is a third party expert who can talk to us about the police and his views on the case, which I think will be interesting. All right, so all that said, let's keep listening now. So we're at the point where her body's been recovered, and this is where all the bizarre stuff, I believe, begins to happen as far as this case is concerned. And procedures to identify the body are ongoing. We are currently treating the death as unexplained. Uh, Nicholas family have been informed of development. Good afternoon everyone. Sadly we are now, now able to confirm that yesterday we recovered Nicola Bully from the River Wire. Nicola's family have been informed and are of course devastated. Our thoughts are with them at this time as well as with all her loved ones and the wider community. Um, look, tell me this. There will be people this morning who will see your face on our screens or hear your voice on the radio and think Perhaps you, you made an error. Perhaps there are lessons to be learned fr from the way you were so unequivocal about how you said, if she's in the river, I will find her. Well, I would like to make very clear. All right. I think I see the first sign of a problem here, and this is down to bad interview technique. It seems that if you saw part one, Peter Folding is very confident in his skills. When he couldn't find Nicola right away, he said, you know, I've got 100% retrieval rate. If I can't find her, nobody can. I've got the best equipment, the most experience, the best reputation. Uh, so he set himself up as someone who is infallible. And what happens is if someone like that fails it's very hard for them to save face because they've set the standard so high. For example, there's a reason on my channel that I openly admit I've changed my mind on things and a reason I use the analogy of the poker chips because I'm not unequivocal about anything because once you become unequivocal about something, like if I can't find her in the river, she's not in the river, it's very hard to update your analysis you know, to update your uh, viewpoint on something because you've already dug your heels in. And to do so would be to embarrass yourself. So to save face, you dig your heels in and uh, you stubbornly come up with any other explanation other than that you were wrong. So being able to update your analysis and not be embarrassed or not be shamed into sticking to something that you know is wrong is a superpower when it comes to getting to the truth. On this channel, our ultimate goal is to get to the truth, not for me to prove how smart I am or how infallible I am or um, to be afraid of someone to say, I told you so. And I think what we're seeing here is the media setting Peter Falding up to be embarrassed if he admits that it is possible she was in the river and he just didn't find her. So listen to how this journalist, this anchor phrased the question, immediately putting him on the defensive. This is bad interview technique. See. Um, look, tell me this. There will be people this morning who will see your face on our screens or hear your voice on the radio and think, perhaps you, you made an error. Perhaps there are lessons to be learned fr from the way you were so unequivocal about how you said, if she's in the river, I will find her. So this lady's just put him on the defensive. Part of the drama in this case I know from the articles I've read, are things that Peter Falting says, where he starts, as I said in, in part one, eventually he starts blaming the Lancashire police and going against them and turning on them. And I can already see the seeds of that dispute right here in the way that he's in the public 
And he is being put in a position where if he admits he was wrong, he gets embarrassed and shamed. And actually, it could hurt his business, right? He's a third-party contractor. Uh, Police forces hire him to go recover bodies from the water. So in a situation where he was wrong, he didn't find a body that was actually there, not only can it embarrass him, especially if he's um, you know, a sort of narcissistic personality. I'm not a clinician, so I can't diagnose him. But let's say he's a bit narcissistic, a bit pompous. It's very hard to admit you're wrong in that situation. So he faces potential embarrassment, um, people gloating over him, telling him, I told you so, as well as the prospect of potentially losing business, of having police hire a different contractor than him, or having his competitors point out his error, his very public error and try to get contracts away from him. So he has lots of reasons to dig his heels in. What does that mean for us? When someone has a reason to dig their heels in, what you should do is when you're questioning them, build them a golden bridge, like Sun Sun Tzu said in uh, Art of War, which I haven't read. I think it's full of bad advice, but this is one good piece of advice. Give your enemy a golden bridge to retreat across. Make it easy for them to backtrack. If she had said, if she had phrased it, you know, I understand, because she wants to get to the truth. Is it possible the body was in the water? Oh, she should want to get into the truth. If you want to get to the truth of whether Nicola Bully could have been in the river and he didn't find her, even with his advanced sonar gear, you should ask him in a way that makes it easy for him to say that. For example, Peter, I understand you're the best in the business. You have a near perfect hit rate. Um, However, is it possible that somehow the sonar did not pick up her body for any number of reasons? Maybe because she was wearing that big coat with a hood and it obscured the shape of the body so it didn't look like a human body or any other reason. You're the expert. What are some reasons that you might have been unable to discover her body? So now he's set up to speak as an expert against himself. Well, as an expert, here's three reasons you could... Um, actually scan a river and not find a body even though it was there. So he's allowed to save face. He's allowed to come off as an expert. And now he has no reason to dig his heels in because you're basically absolving him of any fault. Um, So let me know in the comments if you want me to do a a series on interview technique. I've done one uh, video, how to interview like a detective, and it's one of my most popular videos. And I've been debating whether or not I should do some more videos about how to elicit information uh, elicit information from people, how to interview people, whether you're, you know, trying to get the truth from a significant other or hiring for a job, um, or you're doing a podcast and you want to learn how to interview someone to get really juicy details that they might not give to anyone else. So let me know in the comments if you want me to do that series. But point is, all that is to say, I can see why Peter might be digging his heels in now. And we need to take everything he says with a grain of salt from now on, because he is facing potential embarrassment if he backtracks now. He was too unequivocal. Well, I would like to make very clear that the police have searched that area with sonar and divers for the last three weeks. We spent four hours searching for Nicola at that strip of the river. I categorically confirm that Nicola was not on the riverbed. We would have seen her. Her body, if it, if it is Nicola, and I hope it's not, or whoever... It, it, the body was found in the reeds, not on the riverbed. And I cleared with the media that as sonar does not search in the reeds, they all know that and the police know that, uh, there was no sign of Nicola Lane on the bottom. Okay. So now he has his, we have his defense that she was not found in the riverbed where the sonar was searching, but washed up on shore a little bit up in the reeds. Is that possible? Yes. Could a a tide have pushed her up there? Even a gentle one? Yes. Could a dog have dragged her up there? Yes. Or, you know, um, uh, any number of things could have caused her body to wash up a little bit on shore where the sonar didn't pick it up. And the anchors right now should be building him a golden bridge to walk across and to say, okay, that makes sense that you didn't find her that way. Perhaps it was the police's fault, who the ones who were searching through those reeds for not discovering her. So this might be the seed of 
lots of disputes we see with this Nikola Bully story that are going to pop up later. In other words, the error is human error. It's human drama, not necessarily forensic drama. But then again, I'm new to this case. I'm just seeing the seed of something here, and we'll see if it germinates into something bigger. And even though I see these flaws with Peter and the media, that doesn't mean the police are also unflawed. I'm sure that they made mistakes too. And we'll get into all that. Uh, and like I said, we will analyze Paul Ansel. He will not be off the hook. We're going to listen to his language. And if you've binged all my videos, you will be able to see things that I see. In fact, if you're a member of the channel, I'll drop the interview in the member section that I'm planning to analyze of Paul Ansel so you guys can analyze it beforehand and compare your analysis to mine. So I'll put that in the member section after this video premieres. And if, you're, um, if you've binged on my video, you've seen examples of honest people and you've also seen examples of liars. And uh, just consider both when you're listening to Paul Ansel. I've not listened to any of his interviews. I've only seen clips. I've seen one little clip where he's wearing a hat and a scarf and he's standing outside being interviewed. And I didn't see any red flags. But um, I'm going to try to find a sit-down interview of him that we can analyze with a little bit more meat on the bone where he has to speak for a little bit longer. And we'll see if we spot any red flags. Unequivocally said to us that if she was in the river, you would find her. And you also offered theories about how there was a weir and you didn't believe that her body could go past it. And yet here we are. Her body had gone past the weir. Her body, a body, we believe, has been found in the river. Do you not accept there are any uh, errors or perhaps lesson to be learned for you? In so this anchor is is doing everything you should not do in an interview to elicit information. She is putting him on the defensive. Now, if he backtracks, if he even gives an inch, he's admitting he made an error. He's admitting he was wrong. He's admitting that he had too much hubris when he came into the case very confident. So these GBN reporters are doing a great disservice to getting to the truth of the story. They're creating drama. And we saw Piers Morgan do this in his interview with... Um, Hans Niemann that I analyzed, where in the beginning it was about getting true answers, but then at the end it just came, became about trying to get um, Hans Niemann to walk off the show by insulting him to get a viral moment. You in this? Not at all. I mean, we recover on average 10 drowning victims a year and a number of suicides, and we got a very high hit rate. The, if Nicker had fallen in the play at the bench where the phone was found, she would have landed in two feet of water. She would not have drowned at that location. I don't believe Nicola went in because the police divers searched that area thoroughly that afternoon, and drowning victims go to the bottom. She could not have made it over the weir in a day. There's no way, and that my whole team and other police have looked to this, it, it, it baffled me. And I, I'm the one on the here today defending my good work to try and help all the families that we do, free of charge. There's no other voice. See, listen to how they've put him on the defensive. He even says, I'm defending myself. Really what he should be allowed to do is explain himself, is to educate us. He's the expert. So they're making it difficult for him to explain anything because he's being put on the defensive. But also he has an issue where he is very equivocal. And when you're that equivocal, what happens is psychologically, it's very difficult to backtrack. So rather than getting to the truth, um, you focus more on defending your reputation. There's a reason my channel is set up with the analogy of poker chips it's set up with me not saying I know 100% um, anything. And in fact, I've, I've taken the time in one of my videos to explain that all the analysis we do here should not be used to convict anyone in court. If you want to convict someone in criminal court, you need uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. All the analysis we do here is not beyond a reasonable doubt. It is a way to detect if someone is being deceptive and you should use it in your own life when the stakes are not life or death or 10 years in prison because it can get you to the truth much more likely than listening to body language or a, um, a lie detector or not doing any analysis at all. So the deception detection we do here 
is not 100% accurate um, ever. Just like almost any analysis is not 100% accurate. And Peter's issue is he's saying that his investigative technique is 100% accurate, that there is no way he could have searched there and she wasn't there. And when you get that unequivocal about things, it's hard to backtrack. It also demonstrates a lack of imagination. There's a reason in every missing child case on the channel, I talk about how the kid could have been snatched by a dingo, right? I say that half, I say that with tongue in cheek, right? I know there's no dingoes in Tennessee. In my Summer Wells case, I actually saw some comments where people were saying, how could a dingo have taken her? There's no dingoes there. DD, you're an idiot. I'm not saying literally a dingo took her. I'm just pointing out that if you have enough imagination, you can come up with other reasons why something might happen. There's always an alternative explanation, even if you got your full stack of poker chips ready to go all in and say that someone's lying. Every now and then you go all in and you lose your hand, right? The facts just aren't in your favor, even though you read everything correctly. And Peter is setting himself up where he's gone all in and he's afraid to lose all his chips. He's gone all in too early. His reputation's on the line. His business is on the line. He did all of this publicly and he did all of it conclusively. Those were all mistakes on his part. And now the media, rather than allowing him to explain those mistakes, is debating him on it and putting him on the defensive. So this is all very bad. Very bad on the British media. It's out there. And the media have come to me for an update. And I want to say again, the police have searched that area along the banks for three weeks thoroughly with divers using side scan sonar and us and you know there's there's always a fall guy and it looks like it was it trying to be me but i'm not accepting it we we've got the sonar imagery of the riverbed which i can prove we have everything there and we done the best with our bit with our ability but that it was not our remit to search the reeds at all that was the land search teams <laughs> Peter, it's actually just sad that you're having to defend yourself. The police have to defend themselves when yeah, the really only important thing is is this woman, what happened to her, and if this yeah. is her at the end of the day. Thank you, Eamon. I mean, my thoughts go out to the family. I, I, I you know, I remained in close contact with the family. The, the trolls out there, and, 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 you know, we need to get a grip of these people. These are just the, the vile comments against the family, the, the police, myself. It's no one's fault. It, 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 it's a very hard job dealing with drownings and missing people. It's not easy. And, and it's all the crime scene investigators who have to deal with this. We have to take our hats off to everyone who actually got involved with this search. And, and it's, the, it's the trolls who need to be exposed, I'm afraid. Uh, Peter, what have we learned at the end of the day? What do you take away from all of this in terms of police resources, in, in terms of the way these searches are undertaken, uh, in terms of lessons for the future? I think, I mean, the, the comms piece was the, the lesson here. The, the police comms piece was the big one saying that, you know, that, that just detracting from everything. I think we need to learn the police are under-resourced. There are no police underwater search units hardly in the UK. It's interesting he mentions the police comms because in part one, I said that the police comms, their communication PR department was overly sensitive. And I actually did a post about this on X as I thought about it more. So I'm just going to read that to you quickly. So I wrote as after I reflected on the fact that the Lancashire police withheld information about Nicola, right? They decided once you get into the business of editorializing, of picking what information goes out subjectively and what information is withheld subjectively, you set yourself up to be blamed for everything that goes out and everything that's edited. Whereas if you just give, put out everything that could possibly help solve the case, you're absolved because you're standing on principle. So even if someone's feelings are hurt by what you revealed, you're on. You're standing on principle. We revealed it, not because it was subjective, but because it would have helped us solve the case. We didn't do any editorializing. So anyway, here's what I wrote. Regarding Nicola Bully investigation, 
The issue with police withholding information based on sensitivity is it implies priorities above solving the crime. It's better to release information based on its utility for case resolution, regardless of who it may, may offend. Otherwise, in other words, detectives should do their job and let therapists do theirs. The Lancashire police got into the business of virtue signaling and being politically correct and worrying about and stepping on eggshells. Whereas if they had just been open with all the information they had about Nicola, as soon as she was declared a missing person, they would be absolved of releasing any information about her potential drug abuse, alcoholism, depression, because they released it for her benefit to help find her. And I think worst of all, according to one of the articles I read, they actually withheld this information from Peter himself. They didn't tell him about Nicola's uh, depression or uh, potential abuse of prescription meds or whatever was up with her. Right? I've only read a couple um, superficial articles. But there were contributing factors, things that she was doing that could have led someone to believe she was more likely to have committed suicide uh, more likely to have committed suicide than the average person or to have been in a state of mind where she might have had an accident and tripped in the water and fell. Now, we cover the whole of the southeast for all the police forces. They got disbanded. Sussex got disbanded. Thames Valley went. The next one is Nottingham. And my, there needs to be investment to 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 get, uh, get resources back in place to assist in these inquiries. If we didn't cover the southeast, nobody would, and there'd be many people still lying in the river today. But forensic search and rescue specialist Peter Faldeen, who selflessly joined the underwater search for the 45-year-old, says he's been made a scapegoat for the force's failings. And former Met Police senior detective Simon Harding says the blame lies firmly with the police, who he believes have let down Nicola's family with a string of mistakes and unanswered questions during the case. And I'm delighted to be joined by both Peter and Simon now. So... At the intro of this video, I said, when is lying justified? And personally, I don't think it's ever justified. I think honesty is the best policy because when you're honest about something, getting to the resolution of whatever you're being honest about, getting to the truth is your supreme goal. There are no other considerations. So no one can accuse you of any isms or, uh, uh, you know, uh, any sort of ulterior motives because you're doing everything in the pursuit of of the truth. And here it looks like we have a battle of egos where Peter does not want to be wrong. He's digging in his heels. So he's wrong for that. The British press was wrong for putting him in a position where he had to dig in his heels. And then it looks like the police were wrong for withholding information about Nicola and then releasing it when they wanted to, it to look like they didn't fail. So they withheld the information about her. And then when they started to get embarrassed about how they couldn't solve the case right away, they released the information to make it look more like a suicide or an accident. So they, they had no principles behind withholding the information. It was clearly just superficial virtue signaling because they eventually did release the information about her that was so sensitive they couldn't release it earlier when Peter started accusing them of failing. So... I can see, like I said in the last video, why this case is so uh, popular, why it polled so high on my community poll, why I've had so many requests for it, because it looks like there's deception um, all around, because people are looking out for their self-interest. It actually looks like the lowest priority on the totem pole here was finding Nicola. Everyone's looking out for their own little, uh, their own little reputation their own little bit of fame. The media wants uh, to get a viral moment where Peter walks off the show. The police want to uh, not look bad for not finding Nicola right away. Peter wants to not look bad for not finding her right away. And at the end of the day, what you have is a case that was fumbled from early on because they were not forthright with the information. So the community couldn't get fully involved they withheld information from Peter, which hamstrung his search. And then he was t 
too conclusive about what happened to her uh, to backtrack later and admit maybe um, he made too many presumptions or that mistakes do happen, right? It's not the end of the world if a mistake happens. So, Peter, let me start with you because your reputation has been on the line here and you feel like you are being made a scapegoat today. Absolutely, Simon. I mean, um, Dan, sorry, the um, police have been searching this river for three weeks with divers, with side scan sonar, the same equipment as we had, and river search teams plus dogs, and Nicola has not been found. We searched that part of the river, the lower part of the river, for just four hours, and I can categorically say that from our sonar footage, which I've since reviewed, Nicola was not laying on the river bed. I can't see into the reeds. I want to make that very clear. And I've always said that to the media. We cannot see into the reeds, but we can see what's under the boat. And I've got a crystal clear image of the actual riverbed. OK, but you never specifically searched that part of the river where she was found? Yes, we did, Dan. We, we trawled like the police every day um, with our sonar. They did with their sonar. And there was no sign of Nicola on the, on the, under the water, I should say, not in the reeds. We, our remit was not searching the riverbank or the reeds. I want to make that clear. So we ran the sonar down on day one, down a couple, about two or three miles down that river. And we never saw no sign of Nicola, as did the police for the last three weeks with their sonar device. The other possibility with Nicola being on the riverbank, like I said, something could have dragged her there like a dog, right? So just use your imagination. When I'm not saying any of these are likely, I think people need to understand when I'm not Peter uh, Falding, I don't speak in absolutes. So when I say a dog could have dragged her up there, I'm not saying a drag dragged her up, a dog dragged her up to the bank. I'm saying it's possible. As long as it's possible, we need to consider it. Is it possible a, draw, a dog dragged her up there? Yes. Is it possible a, a bit of the tide pushed her up there? Yes. Also, is it possible that she was half dead, pulled herself up onto the bank, and then eventually passed away due to hypothermia? Yes. Right. So she could have jumped in the water to kill herself and then decided you know, she was going to change her mind too late. Uh, pulled herself up on the bank and then expired because of hypothermia or was um, drugged up, fell in, or not even drugged up, just totally sober, fell in, got exhausted trying to fight against the water, weighing her down with her coat and all her clothing, pulled herself up on the riverbank halfway and expired due to hypothermia or um, succumbing to water in her lungs, right? So she was already choking and drowning, pulled herself up halfway and then expired. So all these are still possible. And could all that could her be on the riverbank that whole time and not being discovered be possible? Yes. It sounds like Peter Falding was searching the water. It makes perfect sense that they didn't find her in the water, but she might have been halfway buried in the reeds. So all possibilities at this moment, even with the body discovered, are open, in my opinion. I don't think the autopsy says, for example, that her throat was slit, right? that there's some sign that she was clearly murdered. Um, I think the autopsy, as far as what I've seen, and I take everything I see in the British press with a grain of salt, looked like a drowning. So could this be a suicide? Yes. Could it be an accident? Yes. Stranger murder? Yes. Um, a murder by someone she knows? Yes. Right? It's All the possibilities are still on the table. Once we analyze Paul Ansel's statements, at that point, then I might lean in favor of a murder by someone she knows. Let's say it looks like he's withholding information or he's pushing a narrative, right? He's pushing a hoax. He's really insisting that it was an accident. Then he might go to the top of the list. By the same token, let's say he sound, everything he says sounds correct, sounds like the partner of, of a, someone who just disappeared or who had been threatening suicide or seemed depressed. And he's speaking in that way like he doesn't know what happened uh, and it comes from the language, then he'll move to the bottom of our list. And now we'll have three possibilities. Uh, you know, our three possibilities will go to the top, the accident, suicide, or a stranger murder, like someone pushed her in the water during an argument. Not device either. So do you think the police 
search the reeds and the riverbeds properly? Well, I can't really comment because I wasn't on that search, but all I can say is we searched upstream where the bench was, where I could, I, I actually said there's no way she had gone in the river at this point by the bench. It's too shallow and she wouldn't have drowned at that point and she would not have have got washed under the weir and I can say that from and I'm happy to do a test at any time to prove that that she couldn't have gone in at that point okay because obviously what people are trying to work so notice how he speaks in absolutes she could not have gone in at that point it's always good when you don't know for sure to hedge your statement to give the odds the reason I use the poker chip analogy so he's setting himself up for embarrassment if someone does prove him wrong. For example, if she leapt, if she ran and jumped into the water, there would be no scuff marks on the bank. Do I think that's what happened? Of course not. But it's possible. You have. I think Peter has a failure of imagination. And it's putting him in a position where people can dunk on him because he's saying things in absolutes but he was absolutely wrong. And now the British media is taking their opportunity to dunk on him. And to work out, Peter, is yep. was Nicola Bully in the river the entire time and not picked up by your search and by the police search? Or was she potentially put back into the river bit? Well, you know, I, I don't want to start speculation. There is a. This is how conspiracy theories start. Why are those the two binary options? She was in the water the entire time, or she was right kidnapped somewhere, killed, and then thrown back in the water later. By that, that's just not how killers operate. They, if a killer did that, right? Okay, let's say there was a serial killer in Lancashire, and he abducted Nicola killed her, and then put her back in the water. I would expect it to be a message. I don't think there was any message on Nicola, right? Um, some calling card. Uh, you, the, a, a, a serial killer, a killer would not take the risk of potentially presenting new evidence, right? presenting evidence that they did it just to close the loop of the investigation. And if they were to take that risk, I would expect to see a, a message like they're gloating to the police or a red herring on her, um, you know, like someone else's DNA tucked into her jacket um, to send the police in a wild goose chase. To me, it just looks like she drowned. So the idea that she was either in the water the whole time or a killer abducted her, killed her, and then threw her back in the water, the media is presenting it's this like it's a binary. Those are the only two options. The third option, which we came up with here on the video 10 minutes ago, is that she could have been dying, pulled herself up into the reeds, expired, and they just did not search those reeds well enough. There is a third very likely option. So it's interesting how the media has a failure of imagination, and Peter, as we know, already has a failure of imagination. So I'm not surprised that he's not pointing out that there could have been a third possibility. This is actually going to be in the Deception de uh, deception deck. If you haven't pre-ordered, thank you to everyone who has pre-ordered. But imagination and how to use it to close the gaps in the story, to fill in the most likely details when you can tell someone's withholding information is a valuable skill. And as you're analyzing something, it has to be available to you. You have to be able to plug in the gaps. Spotting that something is missing, right? Realizing that someone's either fabricating a story or withholding information, right? Or they're editing a story is only half the battle. Then you have to go into their head and figure out why might they be withholding the information. Maybe they're withholding it because they're embarrassed. Maybe they're withholding it because someone paid them to, or they're scared of getting punished, or because by holding information they get more attention. So just because someone's being deceptive does not necessarily mean they're guilty. There's plenty of other human motivations to be deceptive. Maybe they're lying because they think they're doing you a favor. We see governments do this all the time, where they withhold information thinking they're doing the best thing for you. Um, 
Although I don't, I personally, I don't agree with that. You guys know my stance on honesty. I think honesty is the best policy. I think anytime someone lies to someone, liars always have contempt for the people they lie to. So then you have to figure out what is their other motivation for lying. But it has to do with that imagination. And right now we're seeing a failure of imagination here. It's a potential. It's on a corner. It's a perfect deposition site, and it's right next to a wall. It, that is a possibility, but I don't want to spark speculation on that. But she was not in the river the day we searched. But the thing is, we're tied. What about where she was me. found specifically? What about where she was found specifically? Had you specifically? I, I know you didn't look into the reeds in the riverbed, but but the riverbed. Did you specifically search there? Yes, we drove past it with a sonar. It was crystal clear. Nothing. And nothing absolutely on the no sign. Okay. Uh, no okay. sign. I would see, I would see a body extremely clearly on our sonar with, without okay. without fail. Okay. Well, look. Stand by. Uh, mm. Former Met Police Senior Detective Simon Hardy. What What do you think has gone on here? I think. I think. Firstly, you've got to, you know, think of the timing of this. Really, that we, you've got to have. Um, a lot of sympathy for the family today. Absolutely. And I think there's a time and a place where this will be dissected. And, and, you know. And now we have the police with their error. Their error, as I pointed out in episode one, of oversensitivity. So I bet he's going to now say here, I, I don't know if we should be discussing this now because it hurts the family. At a certain point, you have to do your job. And if someone gets triggered by it or, or gets their feelings hurt or gets a boo-boo from it, let the therapists deal with that. The police should not be in the business. Detectives should not be in the business of coddling, of sensitivity. This is a bad message to send because it shows that you're prioritizing something above solving the case. If they fumbled, which they did this case, they should be analyzing their failure. And I don't know if they should be talking on this particular show about it because I, I don't have much respect for this host from what I've seen here. But they should be addressing it publicly because the longer they refuse to address it, the less trust the, the British population has in them, the average person who's not stupid and realizes that they're being lied to, and the harder it is to dig themselves out of this hole. So... I can see why this case has so much attention because it's almost the nexus of failures across the board and different types of failures, a failure of sensationalism from the media, a failure of ego from Peter and a failure of virtue signaling from the police, from the government. And we haven't even looked at Paul Ansel yet. Right at this point, I think he might be innocent in all this, just seeing how much failure has surrounded the case. But then again, we will analyze his statement because let's say someone is a serial killer or a murderer. This is the perfect scenario you want. A bunch of people bumbling around and pointing fingers at each other rather than looking at you. You know, it's it's, it's going to go that way. And, and you're looking at really, you know, the, the, this started with a media problem the uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people have touched on that where the messaging that came out was, was wasn't quite as balanced as it should have been and i think that will be looked at um the police albeit not on purpose gave the impression that they were really fixed on one particular hypothesis and not the others and i think then people started to think well the family don't believe you so we're going to come and you know come to the scene and then it became well, a real circus around the scene itself. Uh this is the danger of conclusiveness and editorializing. Right? Just like I said in this tweet, the more I thought about this case, the more I realized it's not necessarily just about Nicola. It's about the failure of people, people's language, the police withholding language, uh, using deceptive language to omit information that should have been released and Peter's failure of using conclusive language when there was no reason to be conclusive. So there's lots of failures here. So in the member section, I'm going to post the Paul Ansel video that we're going to analyze so you guys can pre-analyze it and give, you, give me your thoughts, compare your thoughts to mine. But I might also do a post in there 
just outlining all the failures I've seen so far in this case. And so you guys can drop your thoughts on that as well, because I do realize that lots of my UK followers know a lot more about this case than I do. I'm just speaking based on reading a few surface level articles and watching this compilation. But I think I can see the seeds, um, the seeds of doubt where they were sown in this case that eventually led to lots of speculation because people realized they couldn't trust what the media was reporting. They couldn't trust what uh, Peter was saying because he was looking out for his own reputation and they couldn't trust what the police were saying because they were withholding information to look out for whatever their uh, virtue signaling agenda is. Um, but then I think you have to look at the fact that behind the scenes, the police, you know, I have spoken to people, police are doing a really good job, have done a really good job. The conventional things that you would expect to be done, and I have a lot of experience as an SIO uh, with murder scenes in London uh, and, and abroad, and I think you know, they, they have done what they needed to do. There are complications and, and in, in these kind of inquiries, this missing persons inquiries, you know, 170,000 people go missing a year and, and people don't want this sort of information and we got a feel for the family today and, you know, it, it was especially where they said, please leave us alone and it's become a bit of a circus down there. There's lots of things in this case which are going to come into question. The social media aspect to it. Couldn't How agree more. Couldn't agree more. And, and by the way, uh, you know, we've been fully transparent about this. They, uh, the, in the family statement, they were highly critical of the press. They were highly critical of two TV stations, Sly News and ITV. Uh, I just want to clarify my position on this, which is that I didn't speak about this case until Thursday. And uh, I thought it was very important that the police and Peter were allowed to get on with their job because I, I saw the media circus that was developing. But when my view changed was when the police uh, went against what they'd said just hours earlier during the Wednesday press conference and released this highly personal information about Nicola Bully, including the fact that she was suffering from the menopause and that she seemed to have an alcohol problem. And I just think that absolutely crossed the line. There you go. See, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. That's the danger of editorializing. So you either put out all the information that will help you solve the case and get to the truth or don't put out any. Because once you start editorializing, you're taking responsibility for everything that goes out and everything that's withheld because you're doing it subjectively. And as you can see here, the media would have pilloried them if they put out the information that she was, that she had an alcohol problem and that she was menopausal and she was probably depressed. They would have been pilloried by the press then, but now they're getting pilloried twice for withholding it and then releasing it. And they're also getting appropriately pilloried for it because they're releasing it to defend themselves. So they're, they're being hypocritical. They're admitting they weren't standing on principle when they withheld the information because as soon as withholding it, uh, wasn't helping them, it was making them look bad and it would have looked better to them if it looked like she was suicidal. They put it all out there. Um, like Mark Twain said, honesty is the best policy. It, there's, a, there's a problem where people start editorializing and we see it more and more often where they, they feel like they have to virtue signal. I have to pick a side. I have to pick what to edit out. What should I put in? What should I put out? Just put it all out there or none at all. Because once you start picking and choosing, not making a choice becomes a decision. That's why you see if someone puts one little flag or, or one little symbol in their bio, it's never just one. Because now they've shown that, that they're open to picking sides. And if they don't pick a side, now they're evil. So they'll get bullied into picking a side on this issue and that issue and the next issue. So it's a vicious cycle. The best policy is simply to put it all out there or none at all. And personally, I'm in favor of none at all, which is why I don't talk about my politics on the channel and which is why I believe the UK police were wrong to try to tiptoe um, and walk on eggshells around Nicola's alcoholism or potential depression. If it would have helped them find her and solve the case, it should have been put out there. And if it wouldn't have helped the case, then they should have never revealed it in the first place. And they shouldn't have revealed it when they were embarrassed later by fumbling the investigation. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So might as well just 
do or don't every single time so you stand on principle. But Peter, can we come back to the river specifically? Because what I'm just trying to get my head around is whether you think that it's possible that you missed Nicola Bully's body in some way and that all of the police search teams missed the body too, because I completely agree. All right. So now Paul has a chance to get out of this. Is he going to do it? Is he going to admit it was possible based on the character flaws we've seen so far? He's going to say no. So this anchor is actually giving Paul an opportunity to save himself. I don't think he's going to take it. We agree. We don't want to add to speculation, but you can understand at the moment, there are millions of folk around the world saying, well, Peter Falling said that the body wasn't in the river. So the body must have been put in the river later on because you've got these two dog walkers, one of whom is a psychic who end up discovering the body, not the police. The problem, the problem is, Dan, the top part of the river above the weir, it's non-tidal. It just flows one way. Once you get over the weir, it's, it's a tidal river. Now, any tidal river, and anyone who works on, on the Thames will tell you, it, things can get lodged in things called strainers, and especially on the corner, you know, on a bend. And the, the, obviously the water will rise and it will go out every six hours. There's a turn of the tide and things can move out very quickly. We worked on one operation in Kent where a sheep was going up and down the river for two weeks, a bloated dead sheep, and it came back to the same point every night. So it's, it can go out and it can come back in again. So there's a possibility that Nicola could have been lodged in somewhere else, a bit further upstream. But I, what I do find strange. All right. He should have answered. He should have ended his answer there. Let's hope he wraps it up soon, because this is what I said in part one. In part one of this video, I said she could have been in the water and the tide was simply moving her to where they weren't looking that particular day and then moved her to the other spot, other spot where they weren't looking the next day. Is it likely? Maybe 50-50. Is it possible? 100% possible. That's all he needs to say here to save himself and to end the conspiracy theories. Strange is that she hasn't gone very far. If she, she, I would have expected her to go further in three weeks than she did literally a few hundred yards just down the stream from the weir. That's what's got to me. Okay. And Simon Harding, where do you see this going? Because, of course, the Lancashire police now have to regain the faith of the public who feel very confused by what has, I believe, become a catastrophic PR and social media disaster. I mean, there were times, uh, Senior Detective Harley, I'm not going to lie, it felt like the Lancashire police were loving uh, the attention. You know, on social media, they were replying to weird posts about some member of the public making up a Lego figurine of uh, Detective Smith. It, it just felt inappropriate. Well, that in itself is inappropriate, isn't it? But the I'll just go back to that point about speculation. Now, I've never speculated about what's happened. We've talked about the, the messaging at the beginning, which could have helped maybe stop quite a lot of what's happened and, and also the potential cordoning of the scene itself yeah, to stop people. Up. But also, you know, don't, this, this isn't the end of the, of the tests that will go on. You know, unfortunately, there's going to be more tests uh, um, on Nicola because... You know, the idea that she's been put back in there as a deposition is, is a complete speculation. And but we'll be able to find out, will we? Yeah, they will know. They will know, and the tests that that, that go through will will determine that. How long has been submerged underwater? Yeah, well, that, there's lots days. of things that will happen around that, and I don't think you know that's 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 going to be hugely you know un unpopular to hear that for a lot of people. And that's in terms of speculating that that she's been put back in there because that's just not. And that's like I said about that theory of depositing her body there, I think it's. The least likely theory, I think it developed because clever people realized that they were being lied to by the police and they were taking Peter's, uh, Peter at his word rather than understanding that he was being conclusive as a mistake and then he was digging his heels in to avoid embarrassment. So his conclusiveness doesn't weigh very much with me. I think it's totally possible she could have been in the water and he didn't find her. I also think it's totally po possible she could have halfway drowned pulled herself up into the reeds, died of hypothermia there, or com completed drowning on the water in her lungs, and then laid there 
until the police or the dog walkers discovered her. The police just simply did not search those reads. So I feel like lots of the language in the messaging around this case is what led to uh, outlandish theories. I still think it's most likely this was an accident. That's not the case, is it? And I will put some poker chips on the uh, stranger murderer kidnapping her, killing her, and then putting her body back. If there was a message on the body, if we find, if the police disclose that there was something done to the body as a way to taunt the police or to send a message to someone. Um, so we need to look out for, if, if you do know of anything weird that was done to the body, um, let me know in the comments. Or if uh, a message was sent to the media or to the police, um, then we might be looking at a serial killer. But I think that's like at a 1% chance right now. I think it's very, very low. There's no evidence of that at all. And, and let's wait for the factual evidence that comes out of the test. But at the moment, I think now it is, let's get away from that family and leave them time to... Couldn't to, agree more. To, you know, to Couldn't agree more. Happened. I've gone through utter hell. Utter hell. I think my point is, is that quite a lot of it has been to do with the way the Lancashire Police decided to handle the case. But look, former Met uh, Police Senior Detective Simon Harding, thank you so much. Let us return, as we have done uh, every hour at the top uh, this morning on Breakfast, to that terrible story about Nicola Bully, the mother who disappeared uh, over three weeks ago now on the 27th of January. Um, much criticism aimed at Lancashire Police over the last 48 hours. Um, this search, well, this, this whole case started with them saying they believed that Nicola had fallen into the river. Uh, from there, much work was done. Wednesday came the bombshell that, in fact, there was vulnerabilities about her, a hurried press conference saying problems with alcohol due to perimenopause. The family have been bombarded. The area was never cordoned off. Lancashire police have reported themselves to the police watchdog. The Home Secretary Suella Braverman getting involved yesterday and saying this is just not acceptable. Um, the family have now hit out appalling speculation and said that they have had the most difficult time. One of the most interesting people over this entire sad, sad event has been Peter Folding, a forensic search, uh, a forensic search and rescue expert who went up there and, and, and did the dive and, and, and said her body is not in the river. His reaction to the news that they knew the police that she had vulnerabilities, we've played it all morning. I thought it a good idea to get him on. Peter, welcome to Talk Breakfast. How are you, my friend? Good morning, Jeremy. All right. So here's where Peter reveals that they, the police actually withheld that information from him too, which is unacceptable, which is a misguided editorializing, so wanting to virtue signal and be sensitive and consider everyone's emotions. That's not the job of the police. That's not the job of a truth seeker. The truth should be the primary focus at all times, I think for everyone, which is why I made the channel. But the, this Lancashire police, that was their original sin in this case. The original sin in the Nicola Bully case was sensitivity, withholding information, editorializing what went out, what was withheld from the public, and that was compounded by ego and by sensationalism from the media. And it was basically the perfect storm of bad motivations, motivations to look sensitive and virtue signal, motivations to guard one's reputation and business opportunities, and motivation from the media to create drama and viral moments. And I can see why this case blew up, because it was the perfect storm of bad motivations. And very last, the very bottom of the list was actually finding out what actually happened to Nicola. And I'm not sure if we're going to figure that out from the police statements. We might figure it out from listening to what Paul Ansel says in his interviews and seeing what we can glean about Nicola as, as a person and what we can glean from him as a person and his relationship with her. But as far as figuring it out from the media or the police, 
that's going to be very, very difficult, but we're going to try. Let's just, let's just nail this. Um, you said to me last night, if you had known as an expert that Nicola Bully had significant issues that meant that the police labelled her high risk, if they had told you that, your search, your teams, would have adopted a different strategy. Can you expand on that a bit, Pete? Yes, I will, Jerry. We, we, we were tasked, with, we went up there to search and we were tasked by Lancashire Police, by the police search advisor, and we were taken to the scene where the bench was, the phone, and I looked down in the bank and I thought, well, it's only two feet deep here. She's not going, it was only a foot last week. All right, so there's lots to unpack here. Before we get into this, let's do this in a part three. I want to do my favorite part of every video now, which is to look at the top comments from the last video in this series. So let's spend a few minutes looking at the top comments from the last Nicola Bully video. And in part three, at the end, we'll look at the top comments from this video. So if you have a good theory about what happened or any feedback on what I've said here, anything to support it, or um, you don't agree with my opinions, drop them in the comments. Let's see what gets voted to the top and we'll feature it in part three. But right now, let's look at the top comments from part two. Sorry, I meant to say top comments from part one. And the title of that video, part one, is How to Spot Over Sensitivity. All right, so the top comment is from Nix Joe. There really is so much more to unravel in all of this. These clips are a bit all over the place. The police briefings need to be done to get the conjecture of how they change the whole narrative all the time, from the name of the road to how they misled everyone into believing that the whole river was tidal when in fact the part where Nicola fell was pushed or even jumped in, whichever it was, wasn't as it was above the weir. And at that point, there was no way she could have gone over at that time. Also, Emma Emma and Paul, especially Emma's interviews, need analyzing as she says lots of interesting things. So I agree. If you've seen my McCann series We're about 16 videos into that, and each video is like peeling back the layer of an onion. So I do plan to get into all of this right now. We're just trying to get the basic storyline, and I think, basically my thinking was, uh, the best way to do that is to get uh, Peter Falding's chronological order, because he's the most outside of everything. So if there is inside information, We'll get to that next. So the police briefings are on my list of things to look into. Emma and Paul are both on my list, and we will get into all of that in this series. And if you want to follow along, be sure to uh, subscribe to the channel so you get notified when new videos are put into the series. And if you're new um, to the channel and new to this series, make sure to watch the series in chronological order in my playlist. This is the DDX Nicola Bully playlist, and you can find a link to the playlist in the pinned comment under this video. All right, so the next uh, upvoted comment is from Night Owl. And Night Owl says, the thing is when you say honesty is more important than sensitivity to the victim, i.e. for fear of causing embarrassment to her and her family, At that early point, at the time of the first press conference, there was still the possibility that she may have disappeared voluntarily because of the personal problems or depression. And if that were the case, then publicizing someone's deeply personal information could tip someone in those circumstances over the edge. I suppose we could forgive the LP for making the decision not to disclose the details then. What was unforgivable was the reason why they suddenly revealed those details at the second press conference, seemingly as a knee-jerk reaction to growing speculation from the public. And this is what I mean when I say you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So they withheld the information. They're damned for that because let's say she did run away, knowing she was depressed or had personal problems with her husband or her family could suggest that this was a hoax like Sherry Papini and she ran away. So if they're going to release the information, they should release that too, so that people could be on the lookout for a woman who looked like Nicola Bully at a petrol station 
um, you know, uh, in the next town over, maybe running away or checking into a hotel. So if that were the case, releasing the information would have been useful. Or don't release anything at all. And then, so you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So when they release the information, they're damned now because they released it to protect their own skins and their own reputation. And this is what I mean by standing on principle. If you can confidently say honesty is more important than sensitivity, when you release information to get to the truth, some people might not agree with you. Some people might have their feelings hurt, might not approve, but at least you're standing on a clear principle. It's not arbitrary or subjective. You're not picking and choosing what information is put in and what isn't. And then um, offending little interest groups or say, well, you, you said she was that, but you didn't say she was this. Or, she, you know, she's a woman, not a man. Or you said she's an alcoholic, but not a drug addict. Or we not equal. And now you're getting into all these little interest groups and little pockets of people who get offended. It's better to just say, look, sorry if we hurt your feelings. This is going to help us find Nicola. And at this point in time, the only victim here is Nicola. And I see lots of comments like that. I'm not saying Night Owl is saying that. I think Night Owl is making a great point. And I think m many of the people see this the same way Night Owl sees it, which is why they shouldn't have done it. Because Night Owl is right. They revealed the information to protect their own reputations. Instead of revealing the information in an effort to find Nicola, which would have been noble. And I see comments on my um, Madeline McCann videos, even to this day. You know, how dare you uh, talk, uh, talk about these parents whose daughter is missing this way? Have you no shame? You're making money off of, off of their grief. How dare you? Well, the point is, I'm very clear about what I do here. I teach people how to spot liars. And if I think someone's lying, and I use them as an example to teach those lessons, I have zero shame about it because I'm doing what I said I would do. And in missing girls' cases, there is only one victim, the missing little girl. The parents are not a victim as far as I'm concerned if, they, if I feel like they were responsible or they were negligent or they know something they're not saying. There is only one victim. Uh, in Madeline McCann's case, the only victim is Madeline. In Summer Wells' case, the only victim is Summer. In the Nicola Bully case, the only victim is Nicola. And everyone else is just... Um, until I rule them out, a suspect. All right, next up from Boltslad32. The Paul Ansel interview with Dan Walker looks good. Looks a good one to dissect. So many questions unanswered on this case. All right, so um, I, I might throw this one into the member section so you guys can pre-analyze it. There's a few that people have recommended interviews of Paul Ansel, so I'm going to pick one that... Uh, Looks like it's about the right length, about close enough to the time where he might not have been able to script answers if he was scripting answers. But just be aware that I, he's very low on my list right now. To me, this still looks like a simple accident where the case and the reporting around it was complicated by a um, pearl-clutching press, a cowardly police force and an arrogant third party searcher, um, Peter Falding. I don't think there's any, uh, heroes in this case who made things simple. I feel like everyone's looking out for their own little interests and we have not analyzed Paul Ansel yet. He is next on the list though, after we do part three. All right. So now we're skipping around a little bit. And I liked this comment when I first saw it from, uh, Shiloh Gal. And Shiloh says, or Shiloh Gal, let's see, they say, it's ridiculous to think it's impossible searchers would have missed her. I can think of many examples in true crime where bodies were found in areas that had already been searched. Brandon Lawson was finally found nine years after he disappeared, despite many thorough searchers, searches and wild conspiracies. Only one mile, sound familiar, from where his truck ran out of gas, it happens. And I agree. Stranger things have happened. Uh, there are plenty of examples where something has been searched for over and over again and simply not been found only to turn up later when a fresh pair of eyes look at it. Um, and this is the reason that Peter should have known better 
when he was being so conclusive. Uh, that was a disservice to himself because now he looks like, he, they, as I said, the media can dunk on him all day because you said this couldn't happen. Well, it happened. Ha ha. Um, and a disservice to people who actually want to figure out what happened because he's painting the picture as if there are absolutes. With something as unpredictable as water, there are no absolutes. All right, and we'll wrap it up with this one from Walla Gerber. L.E. and the medical examiner should be able to estimate how long she was in the river. If the autopsy tells us she's been only a day or two in the water, I am open to foul play. <clears throat> I would be open to foul play, but remember, like I said, she could have been in the water for just a few hours or a few minutes and then climbed up onto that river bank and expired and not been discovered for however many days. So just because um, it looks like she wasn't in the river very long, as long as she's got the water in her lungs that shows that she uh, died of drowning or if she died of hypothermia, it's perfectly possible that it doesn't look like she was in the water for a long time. She could have only been in the water for a few minutes, been unable to swim or bad at swimming with the heavy jacket, weighed down, swallowed a bunch of water, got it in her lungs, pulled herself out of the water into the reeds and died and stayed there. That is possible. That is possible and it's more likely, in my opinion, than a killer who abducts their victim, kills them, and then brings them back to the scene of the crime to dump the body to close the loop on the investigation. So let me know your thoughts. Um, let's see what comments go to the top on this video. We'll analyze them in part three. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe so this video gets more um, uh, reach. And until next time, stay true.